a little bit more from Acts 4. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayers. May God add his blessing to the reading of this word. You can be seated. And as we start, let's pray. Oh Lord, as I stand here ready to preach your word, I recognize that I need your help to bring out the glory of, of what it means to be a, a church devoted to prayer. So I pray, Lord, that you would um, help me to speak your word faithfully and with your spirit's power. I pray, Lord, that you give each person here ears to hear your word. I pray, Lord, that it, it would convict us where we need to be convicted. It would encourage us, Lord. It would lift us up. And Lord, it would direct us in the way we should go. We pray for your blessing on this time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I've heard it said, if you want to make a church feel really guilty and just really down on themselves, you should preach on one of two things. Prayer and evangelism. Prayer and evangelism. Now, it doesn't have to be that way, but it's often that way where every Christian we know we ought to be praying. We ought to know that we ought to be sharing the gospel. But it seems to be the type of thing that we all know we're falling short in. It's really because the bar is so high. We know that, that there's more that we could apply. So as soon as the preacher starts preaching on prayer, you might squirm, squirm a little bit in your seat and say, oh, how much did I pray this week? How much, did I, how much time did I set apart for prayer? And it can be convicting. And that conviction is a good thing. It is a good thing. But I don't think that guilt is the way that we ought to go. And I don't, I don't want to lean into this sermon where at the end of it you say, okay, I got it, preacher. Pray more, pray better. And break. And we all part. So pulling yourself up by the bootstraps is not what we're going for. It's not what we're going for. Well, what, I, what, do I, what do I want? I want you to come away with this. That a life of prayer, a life of prayer with God and with God's people is a gift. It's a beautiful gift to be able to pray for one another, to pray together, and even to, for you personally to pray to the Lord, to have a relationship with God. It's a gracious thing from our Heavenly Father. I want you to see how much you need prayer. How glorious prayer can be. And how prayer is one of the great works that God's calling us to do as his church. So as we look at our passage, we see in Acts 2.42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. The last three weeks we've gone through each of those words. So the apostles' teaching, we looked at how God's church is all about the word of God. They're all about the preaching and teaching of God's word. We looked at the fellowship. God's people are all about, about their shared life in God. Their shared knowledge of, of who God is and their, and their commitment to him. And their fellowship with one another. We looked at the breaking of bread. Seeing that that not only referred to meeting in homes, but it actually referred to the Lord's Supper. That they were committed to remembering and to participating in the Lord's Supper together and remembering the gospel. Well, today we get to the fourth and final one. They were devoted to prayer. And we ought to be devoted to prayer. Really, once again, it's a simple main point of this sermon is be devoted to to the prayers. Be devoted to prayer. But there's so much more that we need to get into. What did, first we should ask these questions. What did the early church's devotion to prayer look like? How did that look? It's one thing to say, I am devoted to prayer. But if you prayed for five minutes this week, is that really devotion? Is that a stretch of that word, devoted? So what did it look like for the early church to be devoted to prayer? How did they pray? How often did they pray? Where did they pray? And I also want to ask these questions. What did they pray? 
What was their time of prayer like as a church? So this is going to, I'm going to divide this up into really two big headings. First, we're going to take an overview of the prayers of the early church. And that's just so that we can know what was the daily and weekly rhythm of their devotion to prayer. What did that look like? We're really trying to establish there that prayer ought to be the priority of our church. As we follow the scriptures, we want to see that prayer really does need to be central. It needs to be our priority in our work. After this, I want to look closely at one of their prayer meetings. So we're able to, we're able to be a fly on the wall in Acts chapter 4 and look at how that early church prayed together. And there we're going to see how we ought to pray, what we ought to pray. We can consider it as a bit of a model of a, church's, a church in the trenches prayer life. So let's get, let's get looking at the early church in prayer. So we see that they're devoted to it. If you look just at chapter 3, verse 1, we already get an immediate example of it. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Right away, what do we hear? Peter and John are going to the temple to pray at the ninth hour. You might have noticed in Acts 2.42, it says they were devoted to the prayers. It's probably calling to mind these set times of prayer that the Jewish people had made a practice, was part of their rhythm. So really the first, first point here on the early church and in in their prayer life is that they followed the Jewish prayer life. They followed the Jewish prayer life. Here it seems that they, they went up to the temple at what would be 3 o'clock. So the, in the Jewish, count, in the Jewish uh, rhythm of life, they would often go to the temple um, in the morning for prayer, late afternoon for prayer, and even in the evening for prayer. And this corresponded with daily sacrifices and to get the priest's blessing. And here, here the, the people would go, and this is just a rhythm of life, always go into the temple to pray. Peter, John, and the whole church are continuing this practice. If you look back at Acts 2.46, it says, And day by day, attending the temple together, and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. So not only do we see that the church was devoted to fellowship with one another, they were devoted to going to the temple day by day and praying together. Think of that as an early church. Just Every day, these believers going for prayer meeting together, going up together as Christians to the Jewish temple for prayer. It's, it's a little, little bit odd, but it's a practice that they redeemed. We actually, if you uh, think back to Daniel, do you remember when the king banned prayer to anything but, but the king? And what did Daniel do? As was his custom... He bowed down, how many times a day? I'm holding it up, kids. Three times a day. Daniel knelt down three times a day and prayed, just as he had always done. So this is a Jewish custom. This is how they lived their life. This was their rhythm. We also see this later in Acts, where Peter, in chapter 10, he's away from Jerusalem. He goes up on the roof to pray at noon. And we see that Away from the temple, it seems that those are uh, the third hour, the sixth hour, and the ninth hour of the day were the times that they would go to pray. So this is a practice that becomes adopted by the early church. Their newfound Christian faith did not erase this Jewish piety. It didn't just erase this practice of prayer. Instead, it redeemed it. It redeemed it and integrated it into the rhythm of their life as a newborn church. That's what the devotion of, to prayer looked like for them, week by week and day by day. As we look further in the book of Acts, we'll see even more how they consciously made prayer their great priority. In Acts chapter 6, verse 4, this is after, a, after there's a bit of a need developing in the church to, to distribute the food um, to widows. The apostles say we, we have to we can't just give up preaching God's word uh, to do all this work. We need to keep doing that. And then in verse four they say, "But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry 
of the word. We will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The apostles would not be distracted by even a whole bunch of good things. There's a whole bunch of good things that they could have done. There's a whole bunch of good things that even we could do as a church. We could become a soup kitchen. We could become this. We could do that. We could meet every sort of need we could think of. But if we're going to follow the apostles and the early church, we need to devote ourselves to what they devoted themselves to. And here it is, the word of God and prayer. We, I think that we often, we get the word of God part, that the teaching of God's word, the preaching is important. But I think we often fail to put the same emphasis on prayer. But do you notice in Acts 6-4, they're put side by side. The apostles say we must devote ourselves to prayer, to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Do we know that we as a church need to be devoted to prayer? Do you know that's God's call? We want men of the word in pulpits, but do we also want men of prayer? We should want men of prayer. So Redeemer Baptist Church, make prayer your priority. Christian, make prayer your priority. Make prayer your priority. Not only did they consciously make it their priority, but they prayed through trials. Let's look at them praying through trials. What do you see in Acts 12, verse 5? So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer was made for him by the church. What do you do when things go wrong? Do you sulk and stew on the bad news and just kind of get depressed about it? Or do you, maybe you're more like me, you try to get busy and try to fix it. If something bad happens, you just try to fix it. You plan. But shouldn't we pray? Shouldn't we pray? What did the church do when Peter was arrested? They made earnest prayer for him to God. That's what they got busy doing. They didn't go, they didn't go protest the government or go, or go write a bunch of letters to, to Herod saying, Herod, knock it off. Not that you can never do those things. But what did they do? They made earnest prayer to God. The early church prayed. I hope that if I am ever imprisoned, I have a church that will pray earnestly for me. Like Peter had. And if I or any of you find ourselves in a jail cell for the sake of Christ, let us be like Paul and Silas. Look ahead at Acts 16, 25. Acts 16, 25. So at 24, it says, Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. Were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Do you hear that? What a glorious scene that would have been. At midnight, in this jail cell, they're filled with joy, singing to God, praying together. That's indestructible joy that these brothers have. Do you have that kind of joy as a Christian? If you do, then you're going to be a praying Christian. No matter what happens in your life, you're going to go to prayer. You're going to go to prayer. These brothers did not give up hope. They prayed and they praised God in the deep watches of the night. Paul and Silas were praying. We must pray through trials. What do you do when you face trials? What do you do when you don't have the answers? What do you do when you're discouraged? Do you fret? Do you worry? Do you check out? Do you pursue entertainment and distractions? And Well, don't do that. Pray. Be like Paul, Silas, Peter, Peter's church. Be like the New Testament. Be like the, the church of the New Testament. Pray, devote yourself to prayer, especially during trials, especially 
as you face opposition. Go to the Lord and cry out to him. Now, as we continue to observe their prayer, I want to look at this under this heading. They prayed to advance the gospel. So just to recap, they, they followed the Jewish model of prayer. They consciously made prayer their priority. They prayed through trials, and they prayed to advance the gospel. They prayed to advance the gospel. Now, Jesus didn't just teach us to go out into that harvest field. Mm-hmm. Say, everybody, go. Go into that harvest field. It's ready. People need to hear the gospel. Go, go, go. That's not what Jesus said. What does he say first? Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest that the Lord would send out workers into his harvest field. That is before evangelism comes prayer. Before missions comes prayer. Before the gospel makes a dent in any place in this whole world comes prayer. That's the model. The early church did this. Even consider how the apostles, as they went place to place, and they would lay their hands on these new believers, and they would pray for them. And then they would receive the Spirit. I think God did that to show how he was advancing the gospel. We see that in Samaria, in Acts 8. We see this in Acts 13.3. The church prayed and fasted, and then they sent out Paul and Barnabas as missionaries. They prayed and fasted together before they sent the missionaries, before they made a dent on Asia Minor. And then Paul and Barnabas did their work throughout that region, and they appointed elders in every church, and with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Acts 14, 23. Do you hear that? Paul and Barnabas aren't just preaching. They're not just organizing things. They're praying and fasting for these churches and for these men and for these families, and they are sending them out, and they are establishing them by prayer. The advance of the gospel comes by prayer. Now, we see this even more clearly in Paul's letters. In Colossians 4, verses 2 to 3, Paul says to the church at Colossae, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word, to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison. How is a door going to be open for Paul to preach the gospel? Through prayer. Through the Colossians praying for him. He enlists the Romans to pray for him as well. Here we see in Romans 15, 30, So I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. Did you hear that? Mm. Strive with me in prayer. Strive with me. Do you know that prayer is work? Prayer is work. It's hard. It's, It's actually something that we have to devote ourselves to and really commit ourselves to. It's, it's not, it exerts effort. Paul, he did this, and it's what he called the church to do with him. He said, pray earnestly, pray continually, strive in prayer. Prayer is no picnic. Prayer is work, which is probably why it's so hard, and why we find ourselves often saying, oh, I wish I prayed more. In the same way that I sometimes think, I wish I went to the gym more. It's, it's hard work. Listen to what Paul says to the Ephesians. Ephesians 6, 16 to 18. Here I want you to see that prayer is not just work. Prayer is war. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying, at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end keep alert with all perseverance making supplication for all the saints do you hear how many times paul told them to pray there and notice that he didn't start a new sentence and say also pray he said take up the sword of the spirit praying praying 
God's calling us to pick up our spiritual weapons, our shields and our swords, but they're connected to prayer. We take them up praying. We wield the weapons by the power of prayer. Do you, do you see that there? We take up the shield, we take up the helmet, we take up the sword, which is the word of God, praying. We do it praying. John Piper, he called prayer a wartime walkie-talkie. Prayer, that's the type of tool it is. It's a wartime walkie-talkie. Do you kids have walkie-talkies? In war, you have these radios and you get, get in contact with, with your generals and your, and your other uh, mates out there on the battlefield to get them to help you. It's a wartime walkie-talkie. And, and here's what Piper says. It malfunctions. It malfunctions when we turn it into a domestic intercom to tell the maid to bring us up another pillow. It malfunctions because that's not what prayer is for. Prayer is made for war. Prayer is made for war. It's made for advancing the gospel. It's made for kingdom work of the kingdom of God advancing against the gates of Hades. Perhaps Western Christians don't pray so much. Perhaps we don't pray so much because we've been soldiers on the sidelines, lost in civilian pursuits. I think that might not be a fitting description of you personally, but I think it's a fitting description of Western Christianity. Soldiers on the sidelines, lost in civilian pursuits. Perhaps we don't know how to pray because we're not in the fight. I hope that this is changing. And I, I do pray that God's giving us all a sense that what we do Sunday by Sunday is vitally important. That what we're doing in gathering is our worship is our warfare. Our worship, our witness is warfare as we advance the gospel in our world. The more we see that, the more I think we'll pray like the early church did. Now let's turn to Acts 4. And this is where we'll spend the, the remainder of our time is Acts chapter 4. I want us to take a look now at what the church actually said in their prayers, how they prayed, what they asked the Lord for. So we're going to read this. Acts 4, 23 to 31. An early church prayer meeting. Just a little context. The Jewish authorities have just warned the apostles to stop speaking and teaching in the name of Jesus. They said, stop it. And Peter and John responded, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. We must obey God rather than men. The leaders then, they further threaten them and then they let them go. And here, the, and here is the context for what, what happens. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continue to speak the word of God with boldness. What a prayer meeting. What a prayer meeting. The response, so think again about the context. Peter and John have just been held, arrested, and warned to no longer preach the gospel, to no longer 
continue teaching and speaking in the name of Jesus. And then they are further threatened. And then finally they're let go. And what do they do? They go tell the church all about it. And what is the church's first response to this? They prayed. They prayed. They lifted their voices together to God. Do you see that? They lifted their voices together to God. I ask again, what do you do when you face trials? What do you do when life's upside down? What do you do when life's good? What do you do in all circumstances? I hope that you pray. I hope that I pray. I hope that we pray like this church. What did they pray, though? What did they actually ask? Well, first, before we even get to their requests, before they asked for anything, they addressed who God is. Who God is. That's the most important part about prayer. The most important part is that you know who you're praying to. You know who God is. Who do they, what do they call God? They lift up their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Who are they talking to? They're talking to, the, to God Almighty, to God who is sovereign. Now what does sovereign mean? Maybe some of the kids don't know the word sovereign. What is sovereign? Well, I'll give you a picture of it. Queen Elizabeth II is Canada's sovereign. She's the queen. She's our head of state. It means that Canada is part of her dominion, part of her rule. Now, that's a little bit hollow with the queen, we must admit, these days in our current system. But it's not hollow with God. God is really the ruler, the sovereign, the king. And where is he the king? Is he the king over Denmark? Just Denmark? No, he's the king of heaven and earth. He's the king of everything. He's the creator and Lord. Consider what Jesus says in Matthew 28, 18. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. How much authority? All authority. Where's the authority? Heaven and earth. Is Kelowna part of earth? Yes. Is Jesus Lord of Kelowna? Yes. He's the sovereign Lord of everything. Sovereign Lord of everything. We need to, we need to follow the early church here. When we pray here at Redeemer Baptist Church, we should start our prayers with the recognition of just who we are praying to. I hope that when you pray at home, when you pray before bed or in the morning, that you remember who you're praying to. It's a beautiful thing to be comfortable with God as a child of God and to just run into the living room of the Father. That's one of the blessings of His grace. But let's not forget who our Father is. Our Father's the King. He's the king of kings. There's a, a little, little hymn or a little poem that one of my preaching professors back in Bible college years ago, he would always say this when he would get, when he'd start going, uh, preaching really on the kingship of Christ. He would always would say this, Thou art coming to a king, large petitions with thee bring. For his grace and power are such that none could ever ask too much. Isn't that beautiful? Who are we coming to? A king. So we bring big prayers to this king. We can't ask too much. He's powerful. He's gracious. Look at what they pray. They pray according to scripture. They pray according to scripture. They, they quote Psalm 2, which we read at the start of our service. And they apply that text to Christ. And they apply that text to what they are currently experiencing. Do you treat scripture that way? Do you see your life as part of the story that God's telling? Are you part of the redemption story of God? You are. You are. You have a part to play. And when you think about 
persecution and opposition to the gospel, you can call on God. You can remember Psalm 2. You're part of this. You're part of this. You can say with David, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? We face the same opposition. We're not facing opposition from the Sanhedrin or from the Jewish leaders or even from Rome. But there's something that we have in common with that opposition even today. It's the same evil one. It's the same kingdom of darkness that's behind it. We <coughs> wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against these princes and powers and authorities in the heavens. We wrestle against spiritual forces of evil in this world. And so we can stand with them and we can declare who Christ is. Notice that when they say, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? Notice that that phrase, in vain, it means that they believe the Lord wins. It means that they have hope. They're not just saying, look at all this terrible stuff that's happening to us. Look at all this opposition. They say, look at all this opposition in vain. In vain. Do you see those, those beautiful two words? In vain. It's, their prayers are prayers of faith and of confidence and of hope. And then they go and apply this to the crucifixion of Christ. Think of this. Even the worst sinful thing that man could do could not thwart God's plan. In fact, it actually accomplished God's plan. Can you believe that? Look at, look at verses 27 and 28. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. So who's against Jesus? All those guys. All those people. Who's against the church in the early church? All those guys. They're still against them. And, and the servants of, of the evil one. And what do they do? Well, they do really wicked things. They do really wicked things to Jesus. They crucify Jesus. But look at verse 28. What did they do? Whatever your hand, God, your hand, and your plan had predestined to take place. Talk about flipping that on their head. That's like taking, imagine you're fighting someone, a sword fight, and the guy thrusts his sword in to kill you, and somehow you turn that blade right around into himself. Into himself. But it's even more than that. It's even more than that. Because not only did, did God just, just destroy wicked people when they tried to destroy Jesus, he actually used that to redeem them and to redeem us. He turned an evil thing for good. And so the church, they're remembering this even in their present circumstance, and they're going through a trial, and they're remembering who God is, and they're remembering that God is in control. That nothing that happens to them, nothing that ever could happen to them, could really truly thwart them, or could thwart God's plan, or could really be unredeemed by the Lord. Now, the church hasn't even asked for anything yet. We're already several verses into the prayer, and they haven't even asked for anything. What have they done so far? They've reminded themselves who God is, how God rules in this world, how God is sovereign over their circumstance. They put their hope and they put their faith in God, declaring that He's going to be victorious. And only then do they even pray and ask, bring supplications to God. So what do they actually what do they actually pray for? Well, three things. Look upon their threats. That's like saying, deal with our enemies. Lord, deal with our enemies. Look at what they are doing to us. Please, Lord, give that attention. This is a real problem. Deal with our enemies. Look upon their threats. The second thing they pray, give us boldness to be your witnesses. Give us boldness to keep speaking your word even in the face of opposition. And then the third thing, do wondrous things through the name of Jesus. Do wonderful things, Lord, through the name of Jesus. 
as we speak boldly, may you do wonderful things. Is that not what we should pray to? We have enemies. We're mocked by the world. We're harassed and opposed by authorities. I mean, our dear brother Tim Stevens is in jail in Calgary this very morning. But even beyond the restrictions and these things, we see an increased opposition to Christianity and to the gospel and to the church. We see it in, on issues of marriage and gender and, and even other, other things. Our book is increasingly viewed as a hate book. There are passages that I could read out of this Bible that could get me arrested on a street corner. When we call people to repent of their sins, we are increasingly viewed as hateful and bigoted. So what should we do? We should ask the Lord to look upon their threats. Lord, deal with those enemies, we pray. We ask God to bring justice. And justice can only come one of two ways. Justice without mercy or justice with mercy. What do I mean by that? Everyone is going to be judged by the Lord someday. And your sins will either be borne by you, either you will pay for your own sins, or your sins will have been justly and mercifully paid for by another. Who is that other? It's Jesus Christ. When he died, he died for our sins. He died for our sins that we put our faith in him and we would receive that forgiveness. So where do you stand before God today? Are you, is the judgment of God hanging over you or have you found life through faith in Jesus Christ? Now that's what can happen with our enemies. Anyone who opposes God and God's work Anyone who's not with us is against us. Anyone who is, who is opposing God and is not living for the Lord, they will either meet judgment from God forever in hell, or they will find forgiveness at the foot of the cross. And we pray for, we pray for that. We pray, God, deal with these enemies. And when we pray that, we don't just mean whack them, Lord. We don't just mean whack them, Lord. We mean, Lord... Bring this around. Either, either take them away, take them out, and judge them, Lord, or would you redeem them and bring them in? Turn them as an instrument of evil for good. And really, that is in keeping with God's heart. But we do pray that. We pray, Lord, deal with our enemies. What else do we pray? We have a great task ahead of us. We're called to be witnesses for Christ. We're called to make disciples of all the nations. We're called to go out into this harvest field to pray for workers and then to be those workers. So what do we need to do? We need to pray for boldness. Are you bold? Are you timid? We can all be fearful and timid sometimes. But we, like Joshua, we need, we need someone, we need God to tell us be strong and courageous. Go take this land. Be strong and courageous, Joshua. Be strong and courageous. Be bold. We pray for boldness. We don't want to shrink back. We want to lean in. This is war, remember? This is war. As we advance the kingdom of God, we're going to face all sorts of enemies. We're going to have people mock us. We're going to have people make fun of us. We're going to have people actually physically harass us and find us and all sorts of issues. Are we going to shrink back or are we going to keep going forward? I pray that we would, we would have boldness and we need to pray for that boldness. And as we do that, we pray finally that the Lord would do wondrous things through the name of Jesus. Only God can take our words and our works and make them grow and make them fruitful, and do wondrous things through them. God can turn someone who's dead in their sins into a new creation in Christ. We can't do that. We can't do that by our words. We can only do that when our words are met and backed with God's power. And that's why we pray. 
We pray that the Lord would do these things through us. We ask him to do only what he can do, what he only can do. We're desperate for God. We need prayer. We need to call out to God. Well, as we close, there's so much that we can apply, but we get right back to the, right back to the beginning, and it's really simple. People, church, brothers and sisters, devote yourself to prayer. Devote yourself to prayer. You need prayer. How can we do this? Well, we pray every Sunday morning. We devote time in our service to prayer. We're doing that. I think we could pray in all of our meetings we have. We could set apart time to pray. But perhaps a good application of this would be that we would set apart intentional times of prayer as a church. We would set apart intentional times of prayer to, of, as a church. And I'm talking about prayer meetings. Now, there's lots of options of how that could look as a church. There's churches that have prayer meetings on Wednesday nights, Sunday mornings. But I just submit to you that you can't be devoted to the prayers and not pray. Somehow we have to do this. We must devote ourselves, ourselves to prayer. It's, our, it's obedience to God, but it's heartfelt, joyful obedience. We pray because we need to. It's how we call on God for strength to advance his kingdom. And we pray because we want to talk to our Father. We've been redeemed by his blood. We have been given his spirit and the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters that cries out, Abba, Father. Let's pray. Sovereign Lord, we, we love you. And we want to know you more. We want to be closer to you. We commit ourselves to you, Lord, and ask that you would take these thoughts and take these things that we've been taught and help us, Lord, to put them into practice. Give us creativity and, and ways that we can um, be more devoted to prayer. I pray, Lord, that it would come from all of our hearts, that we would, be, we would truly be your children who are crying out to you for all the things we need. We need you, Lord, every hour. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.